Hello, my name is Brian Kaiko, and I'm here to discuss English language resolutions in Ontario municipalities. So the first thing I thought I would discuss is why I chose this topic. So I am from Sault Ste. Marie. I moved to Grand Prairie at age 10. Um, my grandmother once told me a story about the English language resolution. My grandparents were at a bar in Montreal and they were talking to some people and when they mentioned that they were from Sault Ste. Marie, the people they were talking to refused to talk with them after. So I knew little about the topic aside from what she had told me and I wanted to know more. I wanted to know how did these resolutions come into being, how were they justified, and what were the motivations behind their passing. So an important part to understanding the English language resolutions is understanding the French Language Services Act of 1986. So it's, it was a piece of Ontario provincial legislation that was passed in 1986, which guaranteed access to French services on the provincial level for certain regions in Ontario. Um, it also affirmed the official bilingualism of the Legislative Assembly of Ontario, allowing MPPs to debate in either language. It also required that bills that were to be passed must be translated into both languages in addition to translating the statutes of Ontario. So on left here we have a map and so the red areas have full coverage, so towns, cities and rural areas in the red zones were covered by the FS LSA. The blue areas only had towns that were covered and then the yellow areas had cities and some towns that were covered by the FLSA. So opposition to the FLSA. The French Language Services Act explicitly in excluded municipalities from its scope. Despite this, there were a lot of claims that implementing French services on the municipal level would lead to tax increases. There were lots of fears that the FLSA would eventually be expanded to include municipalities, and there were a lot of detractors. Premier David Peterson had to defend this legislation against said detractors, and he did meet with the Alliance for the Preservation of English in Canada, otherwise known as APEC, in 1989. On the left here, you can see the text, and at the bottom, it says, and does not include a municipality or a local board as defined in the Municipal Affairs Act, other than a local board that is designated under Clause E. And that is from the French Language Services Act. So the English language resolutions themselves. So in summary, these resolutions would declare a municipality to be monolingual with English as the only official language of the municipality, often phrased in terms of working language or something similar. Since the French Language Services Act did not cover municipalities, all of the resolutions that ended up passing were purely symbolic in nature. There was nothing concrete about them. They were more about affirming municipal opposition to the FLSA. So these English language resolutions were supported by English language rights groups. So the most prominent being the Alliance for the Preservation of English in Canada, otherwise known as APEC, as well as the Sault Ste. Marie Association for the Preservation of English Language Rights, otherwise known as SAPLER. There were a couple other groups that existed from time to time as well. So APEC did not have a branch in Sault Ste. Marie, instead they had SAPLER instead. And both of these groups share ideological roots stemming from Jock Andrew and his books. So the ideological roots of these groups, they start with Jock Andrews. So Jock Andrew is a retired naval officer. He is the author of Bilingual Today, French Tomorrow, Trudeau's Master Plan and How It Can Be Stopped and enough, wake up, English-speaking Canada, enough of this absurdity. So Jock Andrew believed that official bilingualism was basically a French-Canadian plot to take over and colonize English-speaking Canada, and the expansion of French services, as in the case of the French Language Services Act, was a part of this plot. So he, therefore, he believed that the expansion of French services and official bilingualism were an existential threat to English speakers. 
Jock Andrew was he was a bit more extreme than both Apec and Sapler. He didn't really hide his racism against French Canadians. He was very outwardly racist against French Canadians, and as you can see in the text, he even refers to French Canadians as the French Canadian race, whereas he'll say English-speaking Canadians or something similar. And so publicly, APEC tried to distance themselves from Jock Andrew, but they tried, but despite this, his books were actually sold in APEC newsletters. He was kind of the basis for the ideological support and his 1989 book enough contained direct calls to support APEC financially. So both APEC and Sapler were involved in directly lobbying municipalities. So APEC deliberately spread a fear of FLSA expansion to municipalities, and they often took um, kind of a disingenuous fiscal conservative position, and they claimed that the FLSA would be too expensive to implement on a municipal level, even though there was no requirement to implement the FLSA on a municipal level. Um, these talking points were kind of used by municipal politicians that were passing these resolutions as well. Um, Sapler used a lot of anti-Francophone propaganda newsletters, and they started off kind of going against French language schooling. And one of these newsletters specifically claimed that Anglophone students who were not taking well to French language schooling would forever be labeled disabled. Um, in the run-up to the passing of the English language resolution in Sault Ste. Marie, um, Sapler made a petition with the text of the resolution and they garnered 25,000 signatures for the resolution in Sault Ste. Marie, which only has a population of less than 100,000. So it was a rather significant portion of the population that signed the petition. And so the passing of the resolutions. So Sault Ste. Marie's resolution passed on January 29th, 1990. It used the text from the Sapler petition, and it was passed by an 11 to 2 margin by the city council. It was also during the Sault Ste. Marie Winter Carnival, known as Bon Sue, and the mayor, Joe Fratizzi, was wearing a carnival sweater at the time when it was passed. Um, Thunder Bay passed theirs on February 12th, 1990. It was passed by a 9 to 3 margin, notably in principle, not solidly, by the city council. Um, unlike Sault Ste. Marie, Thunder Bay wasn't even designated for French services under the French Language Services Act. Um, so it was passed in principle, but and it was symbolic in the first place because there was no actual coverage and the FLSA excluded municipalities. Um, 42 other municipalities kind of had passed similar resolutions by this time, including Sault Ste. Marie, but Sault Ste. Marie and Thunder Bay were the largest two to have an English language resolution. So both of these resolutions were symbolic, so even more for Thunder Bay, though. Both municipalities were struggling to manage French language schooling, and of course, there were, at the time, there was general anti-French sentiment following the Quebec referendum and around the time of Meech Lake and Charlottetown. So, in conclusion, these resolutions were officially justified through the claim that they were a cost-saving measure and that the FLSA would be a bit too expensive to implement on a municipal level despite the FLSA explicitly excluding municipalities. And these were kind of part of the lobbying efforts of both APEC and Sapler. They, these groups are what ultimately pushed through these English language resolutions through their lobbying. And to these English language rights groups, pushing against bilingualism and French services was a part of an existential battle. They viewed it as either it was the English or the French who were going to win in Canada. So even a symbolic resolution was kind of viewed as a victory. I would just like to say thank you for viewing my presentation on English language resolutions in Ontario municipalities.